Okay, so let's go ahead and get this part started so that way everybody can get home or do whatever you got to do. So segueing in from our scenario, we got the explosion there on the dam. Now let's talk about injury patterns and the care for it. Some of the stuff we are going to be able to do, other parts like field amputation, we're pretty much not going to do. Follow your protocols and current treatment guidelines. Okay, so this presentation was um, made by CDC and American College of Emergency Physicians. It's 130 slides long. We're not going to go through all 130. All right, so this is, this is everybody who has contributed to this presentation. All right, so we'll look at the background, explosive, explosive events, blast injuries, crush injuries with compartment syndrome, a lot, a lot of this information comes from the military. It's where we make a lot of um, medical leaps forward, especially when it comes to trauma. So again, you know, looking at terrorism, we've already talked about that. IEDs, improvised explosive devices, pretty much anybody with a basic knowledge of chemistry can make these, or you know, you can go down to Local gun store, get a bunch of tannerite, make your own homemade explosive. Cinderary bombs, RPGs, we're not going to see too many surface-to-air missiles around here. So these are high explosives, nitroglycerin, dynamite, plastic explosives, ammonium nitrate, TNT. What do think is going to be probably the most common around here? Ammonium nitrate, right. I can go down here to the co-op and find it. Your low order petroleum products, gunpowder. Gunpowder is one of those ones that can go either way depending on how it's contained. If you put it in a hard lead pipe, it's going to have more time to become more lethal and a higher explosive. So the entire area is crime scene. Remember, scene safety, not all the bombs are going to be just simple explosives. They can do what they call a dirty bomb, put other materials in it to cause a higher casualty rate. Again, look for secondary devices, shrapnel, building collapse is also going to be a concern for the buildings. Airborne contaminants, contaminated patients, scene perpetrators, and Terrorist patients, they may hide among the terror, uh, patient population. We've seen that. All right. Make sure you have proper PPE. We don't carry half of this stuff with us. So be careful on these scenes because it can go from bad to worse in a blink of an eye. All right, so triaging. So we're going to look at walking wounded, right? Get all them moved to one area. What's another thing you can do with the walking wounded? Ask right, you can ask them what happened. You can also use them to help you. If you have somebody you know that has an extremity trauma that's bleeding, here, take this bandage, hold it on their leg. I got to go. So... If you have a massive incident like this, a lot of people are going to leave anyways and seek treatment on their own if they can uh, get from the scene. And so there'll be a delay in care. Uh, hospitals will get overran first by the people that don't need a lot of care because everybody and their brother that was within five miles needs to be examined now. 
or so they think. So they'll get inundated with a bunch of people that drive POV to the incident while we triage and sort everybody else and evacuate everybody else through other means. All right, so looking at the explosive event, you have the cone. So as distance goes away or upward, is going to be less severe of the injury or byproduct of the blast, except for if it is a dirty bomb and it gets up in the atmosphere or the wind is blowing, it will carry that part. But the ex actual explosive part itself is going to be limited depending on how big it is. So here's the Oklahoma City bombing. Each person here represent, represents red is dead, yellow they got admitted, blue they were treated and released, green not injured, and then I think I only saw one black or purple. That was, nope, two. Three treated by on-scene physician released. So as you can see where we're talking about with that cone, everybody down here where the blast initially um, detonated died. And then if you go up, you can make that triangle. And then everybody outside there was either admitted or treated and released. What's going to be a problem in a subway with an explosive event? Access. Sorry? Access. Access, yes. But that subway tunnel is going to contain that blast and amplify it bigger than what it initially would have been. Where if it, if it blew up in the open air, it's not going, it's going to be deadly, but not as deadly as if it's in the tunnel. Because those heat and gas need to go somewhere and they take the path of least resistance. And so it's going to compound that explosion. All right, so here's where we're talking about where we had to worry. The primary injury, which is caused by the blast wave. Secondary is by the flying debris. Tertiary is caused by the blast wind. And then we have, they've lumped it all into other for everything else that may happen to a person. So when we think about anatomy and we think about that initial blast wave, what, what do you think is going to be injured first? Right. So the area facing the blast, and with that pressure wave, you have to worry about hollow organs, right? And what are the hollow organs that we have? Lungs. Okay. Hollow organs. What what do we have besides lungs? Lungs is our ruben set. Give me another hollow organ. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> Abdominal cavity, right? Yeah. So that pressure wave is going to damage all your hollow organs and most definitely probably rupture your eardrums. And that's one thing that people don't think a lot about when they start talking about blasts is the eardrums. So that's going to do what to the patient? Equilibrium. Equilibrium, what else? What else? Communication. Exactly. Communication with the patient. So they can't hear you. How are you going to assess them? Eventually they'll figure it out. So here's a good graphic. So your initial, <laughs> your primary blast is going to injure your ears, lungs, and intestines. Your secondary is going to be all the shrapnel caused by the explosion. So, if you 
it's hard to tell here. There's a bunch of debris right there going after this guy. Tertiary is going to be where he impacts on the ground. And anything that falls on top of him. So common injuries, blast lung, marrow trauma, TBI, concussion. What's going to be the issue with the brain? With the blast injury? Right. Coup contra coup. So front and back or side and side. Since brain does move around just a smidge. So the one that causes the most mortality, if you're not instantly consumed by the explosion itself, is going to be the secondary. May highlight it for us. That's going to be the number one cause of death from these explosions. Now, one of the other things that they've been doing is packing. Not only do you have to worry about other debris, but you also have to worry about that person itself. Um, you can be have fragments of other people's bones in you if they had diseases intentionally, so that way they could blow themselves up and cause more damage. Also, had to worry about that. So secondary injuries, trauma to the head, neck, chest, and abdomen, everywhere, fractures, traumatic amputation, soft injuries, soft tissue injuries. Shrapnel wounds, are we going to take these out in the field? No. What are we going to do? Secure in place. Secure in place. Right. Let Dr. Gavik pull it out. Yeah. Uh, he was listening to Nine Inch Nails. Hmm? So the tertiary injuries is the injuries caused from being thrown by the blast. So, you know, if you're, let's say you were working on top of a roof and the AC unit you were working on exploded, the tertiary injury is going to be you being thrown off the roof onto the ground. So that's where all your fractures are usually going to come into play. So anything not covered in the initial secondary tertiary, I'll get lumped into the rest. The heat, the radiation, or other dirty problems. Hmm. Can you expand on that a little bit, Doc? Right, blast lung. So, with what they call blast lung, so with all these symptoms, what can that can be what? Just about anything, right? So are we going to know in the field if that's what blast lung is going to be their diagnosis? So how are we going to treat these people? High flow oxygen, CPAP, intubate if necessary. Right. So even if they don't hit their head, they may have a concussion or a mild TBI. And why is that? Well, that shock wave, in essence, is pretty much acting as a blunt force trauma. So depending on how close they are to the blast is going to dictate how high of an index of suspicion you're going to have with what kind of injuries. 
So the closer they are, the worse it's going to be, right? Talk about the eardrum rupturing. It's probably going to be your most common. Abdominal injuries, like we said, a lot of hollow organs in there. That blast wave is going to damage probably almost all of them if they're close. So again, all the signs and symptoms, which could be a bunch of different things, but being that it's a explosion, we're going to be more suspicious for um, what they call it, blast abdomen. So for initial assessment, it's going to be a chaotic scene. Try not to get focused in on just one thing because these people are going to be multi-system trauma and they're going to have a lot of, a lot of things wrong with them. Uh, be careful with fluid administration because if you overload them with fluid, it's going to go where you don't want it to go in the lungs. Yeah, I'm re-hitting it. It's kind of like a stomping point. So, like I was talking about before, confined space explosions are going to be an issue as well because it's just going to amplify that shock wave. So, who can tell me about crush injuries and what the danger is there? How about you, Tom? What, what's the biggest thing that we're looking at in crush injuries? Compartment syndrome, built up of lactic acid. Rhabdo. Yep, rhabdo. <laughs> I think they need a lot more than a pedicure. Really? So we've seen multiple cases, not from blast injuries, but really essentially from narcotics. The people that get so obtunded that they end up laying on an extremity to create a department center. So they end up cutting off the blood flow to their arms. We have one in the leg recently. The patient fell kind of just so stoned that they became obtunded and we were found down and we brought them in for an overdose and department so compartment syndrome can take place anytime um, perfusion pressure falls below tissue pressure can't pass that barrier So with those, you have to worry about reperfusion of that area, but you also have to worry about how long have they, how long has the blood flow been cut off from that area. The longer it is, the worse it's going to be for them. And what can we do to combat that if we suspect that they've been crushed for a while? Hmm? I'm asking in general. He's the only one answering. Right. So what don't you want to protect from So this is something you do need to know for sure. If you suspect them as a compartment syndrome, they lose their airway. Because let's say they have respiratory failure. What don't you want to sex right Because the release of passengers can cause them to have a respiratory arrest. You do not want to lose some or crushing Lots of passengers are being protected. There is most affected by crush injuries. Obviously, it's going to be your upper and lower extremities, pelvis, your glutes, abdominal muscles. So with crush syndrome, it can occur even without trauma. Um, 
like I said, if a perfusion pressure doesn't meet the tissue threshold, it's not going to uh, perfuse. And there you're going to go into rhabdo and have all the other major issues associated with it. So with all that, here are all the problems that you're going to have, right? So potassium, calcium, you're going to go into arrhythmias, phosphate, myoglobin, renal damage, fluid shifts, put them in a renal failure, more damage. Lactic acid, you're going to put them in acidotic state. All right, so how are we going to treat the crush injuries or compartment syndrome? Or So let's say I had a boulder laying on my arm, and we got the resources to get it off. How are you going to treat me? Hmm? IVs, what else? Pain medicine. Fluids. Could we use a tourniquet to keep on my arm? If we're going to release that boulder? Yeah. Because if we put that tourniquet on, it's going to do what? Yeah. Keep, keep all that bad stuff that's been building up distally of that injury where it's at. So that way it doesn't flood back into the system, cause me to go in cardiac arrest. So the longer you delay, the higher the mortality rate is, which should be obvious. So we do our initial survey, initial stabilization, fluid resuscitation before they're extricated. Um, so if it's going to be prolonged, like if I had a boulder on my arm, I'm sure it's going to take a little while to get equipment out there to get that boulder off. Or same thing with MVAs, prolonged entrapment, especially if like the dash is crushing in on their pelvis and it's going to take us a while to get to them. Field amputation, we're not going to do. We'll have Dr. Gavi come out and do it for us. What? Yeah, that's, that's not good. <laughs> I thought we had one. That's why we got to carry chainsaws now. So military experience has really driven our trauma care and our research because they happen to be trauma prone based on the nature of the occupation. Um, with each conflict that we have, mortality rates drop significantly. If you look at the numbers that died in World War I compared to the numbers that have died in OIF, OEF, it's significantly less. Because with each conflict, we learn more and more new things. Um, thanks to the war in the Middle East, we are now pushing tourniquet usage. Before that, tourniquets were kind of shunned as maybe a last ditch effort, if that. Now it's become one of the primary uses for uncontrollable extremity trauma, extremity hemorrhage due to trauma. So, like I was saying, so if we look at World War II, about 30% died after being injured on the battlefield. You go to global war on terrorism, we're down to less than 10%. That's due to all the research that we've done, changes in medic, medical field care, as well as education for the medics. Um, global war on terrorism has also helped with hemostatic agents and dressings. I know first time I went out, quick clot the powder just come out, and they thought that was the cat's meow. Uh, then they found that guys were using it on themselves, that they nicked themselves shaving. 
and it's a caustic agent, so they were getting burns on their face. Or if you have somebody that has a wound that you pack powder into, once that helicopter comes to get them out of there, the rotor wash is kicking all that dust up into the air, getting into the eyes, causing problems. So now they have permeated dressings, which does the job a lot better. So like I said, tourniquets, liberal use is encouraged. Uh, anywhere around here, they're not going to have the tourniquet on long enough to cause damage. Unless for some reason we have a huge mass casualty event. And at that point, we're probably not going to have enough tourniquets, homemade or commercial, to treat everybody. Uh, apply them early. Apply them properly. You want to go at least two inches above the injury site never on a joint. You want to make sure that you stop the bleeding and there is no distal pulses. Hemostatic dressings, uh, we currently do not have these on the truck. Uh, they do cause a chemical reaction with the blood. And that's why they work to cauterize the wound, but you have to put it directly on the source of the bleeding. And that's why a lot of places don't carry them because Let's face it, we don't get into enough trauma around here to justify the cost because each dressing is about $45 a piece. And that's on the low end. That's getting the discount. So if we have a bunch of people that have minor to moderate trauma and they start putting these dressings on them, we're throwing a bunch of money down the drain and they really don't need it. Like I was saying, quick clot, exothermic, burns at 147 degrees. And that's how it clots off that area. All right, so just like everything else, special considerations need to made, be made for pregnant women, children, elderly, disabled, and language bearers. Think you can have a language bearer for somebody you can't hear? Yeah, that'd fall under a language barrier because now they're not able to fish effectively communicate how they used to. So with the pregnant women, you have two patients. You have the mother and the unborn baby. So if they're in the second and third trimester, they'll probably get admitted for continuous monitoring of the child. Um, what's one of the problems when you start get to the elderly population? They have a lot of comorbid factors, right? Take different medications that can mask what? Right. Uh, one of the things to think about is for if you have a disabled person and you don't, and if it's a blast and they were thrown from the equipment that they use on a regular basis, you may or may not know that that is the reason for that. Say somebody that's not able to walk in a wheelchair, they get thrown from their wheelchair, that the blast wasn't the cause for them not able to feel their legs. So keep that in mind. Or if, you know, they can't feel their legs and you ask them what hurts and they said, nah, I'm fine. Make sure you do the full assessment of, okay, well, there's some clothes laying on top of your legs, but we look and you have a bleed. Language barriers. Uh, what's the biggest language around here besides English? Spanish. Spanish. How many people speak Spanish? Okay, how many people can effectively speak Spanish to men, uh, medical triage? Somebody. Oh, that's Dragon. He's in the University. Okay, <laughs> what if Dragon's busy? Then we're shitting. You're so prepared by the code. Right. So you have to find other ways. So there's apps on phones. Um, worst case scenario, you can call on dispatch to use a language line. 
But do what you can with what you have. Usually, I'm sure there'll be somebody there. If it's a large Spanish-speaking population, there's usually at least one person that can speak English for you. Yeah, put them on your hip and keep them with you because they now become your interpreter. There's, there are great cards that nobody has that you can use. It's kind of like using hieroglyphics. All right, anybody have any questions? Does anybody have any questions that's pertinent to the class? No. No? Not going to anything else you'd like to add?